No, it had the recording thing beforehand. But it can't be that the words are recorded. No, no, it can't be. It's an impossibility. Okay, so uh, I picked this one because we were going to do something short, uh, and I realized only recently that um, it's possible I'm going to have to cancel Thursday or like tail him or maybe both my stream for an annoying reason, which is I have to give a final uh, for Turo for the whole writing thing that I'm doing. And I thought I could do it early, but I, I have to do it during the time that they're doing it. So I'll keep you posted about that. Um, so uh, I don't know how far we're going to get in this one because it's short on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's difficult to read and, um, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so this is, we typically say this when, which I'm Malach Friday night? Yeah, so we say this Friday night after Ms. Morshia Lema Shabbos. Okay, and it's the one that comes after Ms. Morshia Lema Shabbos. Oh, you know what? I have, a, I have an English if you want. I just want to have the whole text. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have that too. I just forgot to give it to you. <laughs> yeah. Not that it would be bad to get art school, but uh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, so the one before this is Ms. Morshia Lema Shabbos, and there is as background information. The Redox says that, I, I think the Redox says Moshe Rabinu wrote from Ms. Moshe Yerli Meshavis until Perak 100. I forgot if it includes that or not. So there might be a thematic unity. And that's kind of what drew me into this one because we say it right after Ms. Moshe Yerli Meshavis, and I feel like it, the Minhag has to assume that it's related, but uh, we'll see what happens. And then the warning is that this is a really difficult one to translate because the grammatical structures are so weird. So I don't really know grammar. I did the best I could. We'll see what happens. Okay. Hashem Malach. Now, literally, that means Hashem has reigned, but it's weird to say that because why? He's still reigning. He still is reigning, right? So there are those who learn this to be about Yemoth Mashiach, and this is what people will say. Like, they'll acknowledge in retrospect that Hashem has reigned, but we're not going to take that approach because I don't think that's thought as we'll see. Um, so I translated this in, in the present tense, and like I said, like, until you could play fast on those with the tenses. So Hashem Malach, Hashem has reigned. Geut Lavesh. Uh, clothed in grandeur. Deus is grandeur, greatness, whatever you want to say. Yeah. I feel like art school translates um, Deus as like girded. Uh, they translate his azar as girded. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which which uh, is part of the dividing this up is hard to translate. It is hard to do. So, Hashem Malach, Geus Labesh, he has uh, clothed himself with majesty or clothed in grandeur. I think art school says donned. Lavesh Hashem, okay, comma, Hashem has clothed himself. Oz Hisazar, he has girded himself with strength. And girding meaning like putting on a belt, like an Azor. Af Tikon Tevel Baltimo, even the world, now it switches to second person, you firmly establish, the world that you firmly establish will not falter or will not shake. Okay, dramatic opening sentence, but weird. Nafum Kisacha Me'az, your throne is firm from from then, literally from then, but meaning from like times of old. Me olam ata, from forever are you. Not to, okay, now this part, uh, our school translates non literally, so I didn't use our school here. Uh, our school puts in the words, their voices. Um, okay, no, sorry, no, the public says that. Where's our school? Our school does something different. I don't know, we'll see. Um, Nasu naharos hashem, Nasu naharos kolam, the streams lifted up, hashem, the streams lifted up their voice. Yitu naharos dachiam. The streams lift up or will lift up. their their roaring. They're crushing. I'm clear how to translate that. Mikolos maim rabim. So here the mem is um that it's a mem as a, of comparison. So more so than maim rabim than many waters, meaning not from many waters, but more so than the, than the sound of many waters. Adirim mishbereyam. The sea's majestic breakers or waves. Um, I think the the English translations go with breakers because they try to uh, preserve the Shorash. Adir yep. Bamarom uh, Hashem. Majestic on high is Hashem. Oh, also, Adir can mean uh, strong, I think, but I think, uh, um, I don't know why I went with majestic. Oh, I think because that, that fit better with the grandeur thing. Your testimonies are exceedingly trustworthy. For your house, holiness is suitable, or holiness suits your house. I, I made the order more natural there. Hashem Hashem for long days. Yeah. Okay. So first impressions and like like just uh you know sentence feeling was a uh, what do you say? Um, it definitely gives me one of those like hill and vibes where like the, he's using nature like nature's like yeah grandness yeah as like a metaphor for Hashem's grandness. Right. Okay. Good. That definitely seems to be the theme. That's going to be the program take from Miri.
Yeah. <laughs> um, something about it is like a mouthful to read. It feels very halting in terms of the like starting and stopping sentences with similar words in a jagged sort of way. Hashem Malach Geus Lavish. Lavish Hashem Oz I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's like poetic almost like there's really like poetic like feel to it. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Nasu you read Natu Naharot Hashem, Natu Naharot Kalam, Yit U Naharot Yakam, Mikolot Maim Rabim Adirim Mishrayim, Adir Bamarom Hashem. So it uses Adir for both of them. Yeah, it, it's it's weird though. So uh, I guess the, the question is um, so we got in terms of our, our other four questions here, the main idea does seem to be about nature. Okay, so we'll, we'll work on that in a second, but let's go to our pivot point. Where would you say the pivot point is? After two. After two, interesting, why? Well, those are talking about um, like Hashem directly. Like okay. what he clothes himself, whatever, his, his throne. Yeah. And then it transitions to the waters. Okay. So that you could divide it in terms of, uh, of wait, say it again, uh, in terms of uh, how you characterize the first half? Um, they're talking about, I guess, Shem himself. Yeah, okay, right. So the first half is talking about Shem himself. And then his throne. And his throne, which is a part of the, the yeah. model of uh, Shem's uh, kingship, and then it goes into talking about the world. Okay, good. That's definitely one candidate. You see another one? So one, two has one part, then three, four, and then five separate schemes. Okay, how so? Again, waters and being less metaphoric, again, goes okay. similar yeah. to one and two. Okay, I definitely hear that also. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking the abrupt change seems to be five because it starts talking about his testimonies which is, it seems to be a type of mythos, you know, Eidos, like Eidos, Chukim, and Mishpatim, you know? So, like, we weren't talking about that before. You know, it seems like we were talking about the world or God's governance of the world, not the Eidos. And it's not even clear what it's saying, that your Eidos are trustworthy. Levesacha Nava Kodesh, for your house, holiness is appropriate, like that, the base of Mikdash. Hashem, Laorath, and Mim, Laorath, and what? I mean, Laorath, Mim is not going with Hashem. Hashem is Meolan, you know, it's, it's eternal. So like it's just the end just seems like a non sequitur on multiple levels. So, so let, let's leave those two as as questions for the uh, candidates for the pivot. I guess are there any other questions that we have to address? I think this one's short enough that we can list the questions like we do for Michelle. What are the questions? The metaphor and the nature doesn't really seem to connect to the initial point that he's making yeah like talking about Hashem's like firmness and eternity and his strength and his non-faltering yeah then like I would expect him to then talk about like rocks or mountains yeah water is, there for a long time that's a good point okay water so, sounds like the opposite like it's flowing it's moving. yeah exactly yeah you like it yes yeah, so, <laughs> good 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 I was hoping you'd go there okay so the question is how do the first few how does the theme of the first to Pesukian jive with the emphasis on water. The first half seems to be about, um, about eternal, um, unchanging firmness, and water is flowy. <laughs> yeah. OK. What else? Although I can see a possibility, by the way, because it does go back and emphasize Hashem being compared to the water at the end of four. Right. Not necessarily in terms of the unfalteringness. But, uh, well, clearly an important question is what is the muscle of Hashem um, clothing and girding himself? And what does this have to do with the, the rest of the barrack? I guess we'll, we'll, with the uh, with the earth and with the rest of the parish. Yeah. I was asking about his, like particularly the invocation of the Kisa. Yeah. Like what's that relationship? To okay, the, yeah. Uh, How does, does the Kisa fit in? 
Okay, so then we have my question on five, which is uh, why in five, in Pasuk K, does it abruptly transition to Eidos, which are a type of mitzvos, and Beisacha, which seems to be a different topic, whatever that is. Beisacha does not, does not seem to be a muscle for the waters or doesn't have to do with the waters here. Also, what does Nava Kodesh mean? That holiness is appropriate. Yeah. And what, uh, why does he say Yeah. Um, also, the analogy almost seems to like not work. Like, talking about the streams lifting their voice. Yeah. And then more than the sound of many waters is Hashem's majesty. Like, right. It's like, the water is really loud and your majesty is more than that loudness. Yeah, that's like, true. Majesty is not like a loud thing. That's a good point. Yeah. It's something to do with volume. Right. I mean, it does seem like, it does sound like saying that though, right? It sounds like yeah. things, streams are loud and, uh, and the Maim Rabim is really, uh, sorry. We pull up Maim Rabim, Adir Mifayam. So I, I'm clear whether the Maim Rabim is also a reference to the waters. We've got the, uh, I mean, to the, uh, sorry, the, um, the rivers, you've got the rivers and they're loud. The, the breakers, are much louder and then god is is more uh mighty than uh is it mighty or more majestic than us and maybe mighty is a better one if it's talking about the loudness yeah, yeah. that would fit better mm -hmm. okay so here's what i propose let's do the meiri which is the one that i was drawn to most because he doesn't say it's not much yet <laughs> okay <laughs> um and uh and then we'll uh and then we'll, we'll we should be able to finish the meiri and then we'll see if we can uh, uh get a uh, a sense of the main idea uh, and I, I think I'd say I understand 95% of this Mi'iri. There are a couple of parts I, I didn't quite get. Okay, so Mi'iri on the right. So nicely, the Mi'iri tells us what the theme is at the very beginning. Okay. Hashem Malach Yuzlavesh. Begomer. Gam Zeh Mizmor, nearly Shuramat Achid Olam. This, it seems to me that this parak also talks about the creation of the world, also meaning because Bizrashim Yom Shabbos is talking about creation. And then he says, Ubifrat al Higalus Ha'aretz, Bihik Pavot Hamayn al Nakam Echad. Specifically, it's talking about the revelation of the land when the water is gathered in one place. Okay, so that's his unified theme here. Hashem's creation and a, in general, but a focus on the, that's day three, I believe, right? When the water is gathered in one place and the dry land was, uh, was exposed. Okay. And uh, it's reasonable to say that, but let's see how to spell it out. Hashem, of Amar Hashem Malach Ke'uslavesh Klomar. And this is the part where it gets a little sketchy here. El Yonim V'Tachtonim. So it means the upper existences and the lower existences. Shiakiru Ktas Ma'alaso Hatsuma, who recognize somewhat his um, tremendous stature. Okay, you have any idea what he means by El Yonim V'Tachtonim? I know there's an idea of like Mayim El Yonim and Mayim Tachtonim. So I also thought that at first, uh, but I think it's saying that the El Yonim and Tachtonim recognize right. God's stature. And water doesn't recognize. Yeah. Maybe the beings, like yeah. angels and people. Yeah, I, that's what I think it's talking about also, right? So Elyonim are the angels, and the Tachtonim can't mean all of the lower creations because not all of them recognize. Yeah. Uh, so angels and human beings recognize God's uh, uh, exalted level. And that God girded himself with strength and might when he made the world Yeshmein out of nothing. Uvahachino Tevel the Emtah Olam, and when he made the Tevel, okay, so you know what the word Tevel means? It's a weird word. Mm -mm. Okay, so Arthur I think always translates as the civilized world. How did I translate it here? The world. Okay, fine. So I, I think it means like the settled port. So it either means the settled portion of the world, like the um, like the play, the the land masses where people live. Or it means the world as a whole, but in terms of the fact that people live on it. So I think when I was, I was preparing this with Ken, and I think Ken and I, I think we disagreed on what this means here. You tell me what you think this means. Uvahafino tevel de emta olam, when he made the tevel in the middle of the world, baltimot vitanua lishum tad, so that it doesn't uh, falter or move to any side. So what, what is that? Just factually, what is that last part thing? When he when he he prepared the the settled world in the middle of the olam, so that it wouldn't go to any side. It's balanced. 
What's the it though? The world. Okay, so one possibility is to say that it's the world. Like vis-a-vis -vis the universe. Vis-a-vis -vis the universe, right? The one possibility is to say the table is the is Earth and the Olam is the universe, which again in a geocentric model. Do you know what the other possibility would be? And the hint I can give you is his intro theme is the revelation of the earth when the water is gathered in one place. Other possibility is I think it's talking about like, like the Middle East and like Europe and like the places where people lived in Africa. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they actually thought that that was the middle of the, of the earth, like, you know, on, on the globe and like all the extremities were, were places where people didn't live and everything else was water. Right. Earth yeah. was flat. So it was the center. Uh, I don't think they thought that the earth was flat at this point. So uh, center meaning? Meaning like on the, like this is the globe, handy right. here, right? That you have basically the, um, the, all the land masses here, and that's where all the people live, and like everything else, everything else. is uh, okay. is, is, is water. Right. But they just had no idea that there's anything, you know, the Americas. In the Erie? Or he's saying that shot for when it was. I, I'm, I'm really not sure, actually. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah, I, I don't know who thought what at what point. <laughs> but yeah. yeah I mean, he was like, he was later, right? Like, he was in the 14, oh, wait, was he in the 1400s? I gotta check this now. Uh, I mean, even that might, yeah. They I, already knew like there was an extended world by then. Uh, good question. Like they really discovered know. America within the next hundred years, years. Yeah, right? Twelve forty nine to thirteen fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, so either so in terms of the upshot here, it's either the world in the middle of suspended in the middle of the universe, or it is the settled part of the Earth that is in the middle of the unsettled part of the Earth, which is the water. And I went that way because of his introductory thing that the the earth was revealed and, and uh, you know, right. and it was gathered. And I think it's just gonna be supported later on also. So let's just get track here. So what is his interpretation of Hashem uh, clothes himself with grandeur? Yes, nine, creation. So that's his interpretation of the girding himself with strength. Oh, it's, um, right, so there's the clothing uh, himself and then there's the girding himself with strength. And obviously they're related, but. Uh, Says the upper and lower existences that recognize God's exalted greatness or strength. Okay, but uh, so what what what's that muscle of the clothing? I mean, I guess clothing is like revealing in some extent. Yeah, like it, like you did something to see when something is clothed. Right. So they're the beings of the Elyon and Tachlon are able to see him to some extent and recognize. Okay. Aspect of his existence. Okay, good. So that, that's also the way I was thinking about it, which is, so the thing, the thing is like this is like, you can't know God, right? right? You can only know him through his creations. Um, so the universe is, can be compared to clothing uh, that is clothing God in the sense that clothing is, is on a form and it conceals the form. Like you can't actually see the form that's under the clothing. That's the point of the clothing. But it, it like indicates or points to the form that is beneath it and it gives it grandeur. Like when a king puts on garments, he's concealing himself in a way that gives him grandeur. And that's really what the universe is in terms of God is that you look at the universe and you see the Chochmah in it and it points to the existence of God in a way that you can't actually see God himself. So it's a good model, you know? And then the, the girding himself with strength, I mean, Remember that was the thing that they did, like soldiers girding their loins, like preparing for battle and stuff. So I guess that's just a muscle for the the most impressive aspect of the creation, which is the Yesh I don't really know what else to get out of that other than, <laughs> than that. Okay, so then he goes on. Vish Lafarsh Der Sacho, if you could explain it in a poetic manner, Shehakel Mis Labesh, the Geus, that God girds him, or uh, sorry, clothes himself with uh, with with grandeur. Clomar. Now, I, I, this is one part I did not understand. Shehulmo Vahul Maso. And the footnote says Clomar. I don't even know what that means. Uh, uh, homo in, in, in the um, dictionary says it, it suits him or it makes it suitable. But the footnote says Clomar, lo raksha hagava holemes oso. Not only is the grandeur befitting for him, ele gamhu holem osa. He fits it. I, I don't know what that means. Velo sharhani, Brian, but not go back to the mirror, but not other creations. But Amar, I don't know what that means. 
Ah Kikon, even the uh, he even set set up Klomer Kikol Geus Iba Lachol Harisas Matav. Okay, this is an interesting point here. All greatness is a cause of of destruction of a situation. Of Ahakel, but with God, he Hanosenes Bahama Amedes Kevel Bakiuma. He's the one who sets up the civil the, the the settled land permanently. You pick up anything on what you're saying here? I'm not 100% sure I do, but I can theorize. Every greatness is the cause of, for all breakings of situation, but God, he's the one who, who set it up to last. I mean, it could be that like strength and greatness is shown by dominating something else. Like right. I'm stronger than this. Right. As opposed to with God, he, just the fact that he created it essentially right. is the showmanship of his... Strength. Yeah. So what's the uh, oh? So you're saying the the breaking of the situation is like the dominant in the dominating yeah. something that existed before. I hear. I hear. Yeah. So God's strength is evident in His maintain maintenance of existence in right. a, in, a, in a stable way. Okay, that, that's a good shot. Yeah, I was thinking of something different, but I think I like what you're saying. But yeah, show me you want to say something. That could also be related back to the whole waves and everything, like him being more powerful. Like even though he's created something strong as as strong as whatever listed, and then still stronger than that. I guess ties into it a bit more. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, that I think is going to be borne out when we read uh, the Miri on those uh, water for here. Uh, do I even want to say what I was going to say? Um, no, nah, I think what you said is better. Okay. All right, next part. The Nachon Kisaha, your throne is firm. Who should he scale the seaport? Bria Sashmai. Okay, now it's talking about the creation of the heavens. Okay. Kiha Galgalim Yifru Kise. The spheres, the heavenly uh, celestial spheres are called a throne. Um, and that's uh, from uh, Open Pazak in Yishayo, Hashemayim Kisi, the heavens are my throne. Maharat Sadam Raglav, or Raglai. V'amar shenivru b'tzivyonam u'batachli shlingusam. The spheres were created in their beauty and in their utmost perfection. Okay, so that's the the the, the spheres, and that's the metaphor of the throne. Ume'az, oh, and also the reason why I think they called it the throne is because that's where the king gives his orders from. Mm -hmm. So they believe that the heavens you know, uh, with how he controlled everything on earth. Umeaz, Ratzlomer, Me'ezhi Baram, and from back then, meaning the time they were created, Umeola Mata, and forever, from forever are you. Ratzlomer, Mikodem Briasa Olam, Shari Ata Barata Hakol. You are before, so to speak, the creation of the world because you created everything. Okay, fine. That's emphasizing God's eternity um, over everything. So we've got the um, the earth, the heavenly spheres, and then God is above everything. Okay, I don't think that's adding a new idea. All right, now he gets to this point. Uh, that's alluding to the gathering of the waters. Uh, so I don't know if he means like that event, like when the waters gathered, then they lifted their voices, or if he's saying that the waters now are lifting their voices in praise, like out of the fact that they were gathered in one spot. I don't really know. And the water rivers will lift their their uh, dachyam. So he's learning dachyam as coal, whatever that is. Um, they will lift their voices based Avram Beshetif al Hamakom when they flood places. Shiid Kauhu Biashlituhu when they crush and destroy. So that's a little weird because I thought we were talking about how God like gathered the water in one spot. But I he, I guess maybe he's, he's emphasizing that the time when you can see the water most powerfully is uh when it floods. You see like the tremendous forces that are being dealt with here, uh, which he's gonna say that God has mastery over. Have you seen the movie The Impossible? Mm -hmm. Uh you know who Tom Holland is? The guy who plays the new Spider-Man? Yeah. Yeah, so this was, I think, one of his like, first roles when he was a kid. It was about the uh, tsunami in, um, where was it? Japan? No, a different tsunami in Indonesia, I think. Okay. Uh, and it's, uh, if you want a, um, oops, I'm to go. Um, if you want a good flood movie of like seeing the destruction of the flood, I, I recommend that. It's, yeah. it, it's a bit of a true story about like this family that gets like dispersed during this uh, tsunami, but it's, it's, it's good. Okay, so um, Adirim Mishbiriyam, uh, mighty or powerful are the breakers of the sea. Rotolomer Galehayam, meaning the waves of the sea. He, uh, Adir Bamaram Hashem, because Hashem is, uh, is mighty above uh, everything. Lasothem Ulashanath Kivam, to do with them and to change their nature. Latseis Chol Gvul Yam, to make sand into the boundary of the sea. Kok Baya Virenho and to make it a boundary that will not be crossed. So I think that is like what you were saying. And that's uh, also what you were saying at the end is that despite the fact that these waters are very powerful, God 
makes it so that the waters have a boundary and they don't just constantly flood over the earth. Like you see water flood, when water floods, how much damage it can make, but things are stable on the dry land. Like you rarely get floods. I think it also connects to the flood point. I mean, the fact that the water has a boundary, it makes the flood that much more significant. Mm -hmm. it usually is contained. It's a, yeah, it's an event that doesn't, uh, not supposed to happen. Yeah, it highlights that. Okay, all right. Now we get to the part which I think, in my opinion, is the main idea. Since all these things are known by way of tradition, and they are drawn after belief in the creation of the world, meaning that if you hold the universe is eternal, then obviously you hold that God didn't separate the waters and make the dry land. You hold that that's just the nature of the universe. But if you believe in the, uh, in the creation of the world out of nothing, then you'll believe this stuff. These are the things that are included in the word testimony. It's Kamosha Bjarn. So he's now making a big move. He's saying that Edus is not referring to mythos. Yeah. It's referring to things that the tradition testifies to, the fact that God created the world. Yeah, I feel like there are other examples of that, where we describe like nature as being a, like an aid to Hashem's creation. Uh, I feel like that also. Yeah. I mean, I know we... Uh, hold on a second. Well, okay. You're not thinking... Are you thinking of... Um, like calling upon the heavens and earth to testify, or maybe okay, because Hazinu is the first thing that came into my mind. Uh, but I think the examples that are more directly about what you're saying also, because Hazinu he's saying, uh, listen, heavens and earth, and most of these testimony, but that's more testimony about the relationship with the Israel, not nature. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are people like you're saying. Okay, now this is going to be, I think, the main point. Your testimonies are very uh, trustworthy. Uh, the, the testimonies of Hashem are trustworthy. And for your house, okay, here we go. Where's your house? Not Beit Midrash. Ulevetra Hanoda b'Matzav Hachachamim Balei Zos Haimuna. So your house, God's house, is referring to the the gathering of Chachamim who possess this belief. Okay, so for them, Nava Kodesh, holiness is appropriate. Wrote the Lomar Nae Lukacho Ulahadra that it is fitting for them to sanctify Him and glorify Him. Lola Kofrim, not for the deniers, the heretics, Asher Loya Aminu Davar, who do not believe anything, Rachma Shiachayat Hahekesh Hamosi, Viyag Zereno Ha'ion Hasichli, except for that which is dictated by logical proof and decreed by intellectual analysis. Okay, so, so what he's saying is that if you are a person who is only, who's not relying on God's testimonies, and you're only relying on what you yourself can derive from your own intellectual analysis, then you're gonna not recognize this point, and you're gonna um, you're you're gonna be in doubt about whether God created the world or not, or you're gonna believe that the universe is eternal. But so the only ones who are really proper to uh, praise God about this, who to sanctify Him, are the Beislecha, which are the people in God's house, which is the Chachamim. And I'm just realizing now, uh, in this week's parsha, wait, no, wait, last week's parsha, last week's parsha was Bahalosa, right? Then um, you remember the phrase that so God calls Moshe Rabbeinu um, Anam Nikol Adam, but then he describes him with a house muscle. Before Beiti Neaman, that Moshe is the most trustworthy in all my house. And the Ramah explains that that means that Moshe had complete knowledge of like the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how that matches up with the, with the house thing. I'm just recalling that it's a, it's a similar thing here. Um, okay, so so he's saying that they're the ones. So in other words, if you are if you are not part of God's house of Chachamim and you don't have access to these uh, testimonies, you will not realize that God created the world and you will not realize his grandeur and his majesty. Uh, and that's what, what the Pilgrim do. Right. Yeah. And thus, you won't be fit for holiness? Uh, so I think... Declare, declare holiness? Yeah, you have to declare holiness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so let's finish reading and then we'll, we'll, we'll try to put it together. Uh, okay. Hashem, or, oh, sorry, Behu Omro, and this is what he's saying, Hashem or Hashem for, for long days. Beloshi Echarit itself, not that it should be destroyed in the end. Avashahu, um, meaning, okay, you don't think that when David says for long days, he means for long days, but eventually it will be destroyed. He's saying uh, for long days, Avashahu Mispala al Zman Shiesh Lafachet Bacharbeno, He's davening for a time when you should be afraid that it will be destroyed. Behu, Kozman Shiesh Lasharha Umot Shulpanos, whenever the other nations have dominion. Until the time when the entire earth becomes filled with the knowledge of Hashem, that's Mashiach, and then no one will be afraid anymore. Uh, and they give the uh, linguistic proof that the word, um, uh, that the phrase would be used this way. 
uh, don't abandon us until uh, I, oh, sorry, I will not abandon you until I have done what I've said. It doesn't mean that, and at that point I will abandon you. It means that like up until that point, I don't need to be worried about abandonment. From here on, you don't need a, a promise. Okay, so let's just go back to the, the text and just like summarize each line of what he says to try to get a full picture here. Uh, and, and the question is, will we, if we get a main idea? Okay, so Hashem reigns, clothed in grandeur, clothed as Hashem, he has girded himself with strength. Even the world you firmly established will not falter. So theme is the, gather, is the creation of the world, gathering the water in one place. Hashem reigning and, and being clothed in grandeur is the idea that we know God's grandeur through the laws of nature, uh, which are like, would conceal him yet reveal his, would, would, glor, would glorify him. The girding himself with strength is the greatest display of God's strength, which is creation, yesh me'ayin. Your throne stands firm from of old, that's referring to the heavens and how he created those first. From forever are you, and that's the idea that you, so to speak, predate the heavens. The stream lifts it up, the stream lifts up their voice, the stream lifts up their roaring. That's the idea of the waters being, um, what did he say about that? But that was the waters. Uh, oh yeah, that's the powerful, um, the fact that the waters are powerful when they flood, uh, which God prevents it from happening because he put a boundary there. Mikulot Maim Rabim Adir Mishprayam Adir Bama How do you explain that one? Um, da -da -da. Oh yeah, in other words, God is more powerful than them because he's the one who set their boundaries. And then, Eidot Secha Nemnum Od, your testimonies, meaning the tradition that you gave us through the Torah that God created the world, they're very trustworthy. And for those who know them, that's the people in the house, which is the Chachamim, Nava Kodesh, it is proper to, to sanctify you. Hashem L'Rachamim, and Hashem, may you grant this long, uh, um, when you preserve these Chachamim until the time of Mashiach, when everyone will know it. After reading all of it, I still think that the pivot point is number five, because he's basically saying that everything said in one through four is only preserved because of the Eidos. And the last part is a bakasha to ask for, for these Chachamim who appreciate this to be preserved. Oh man, I need to bring a book. It's a great thing to read. Um, okay, I'll, 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 I'll summarize it. But um, there's a book called Coming of Age in the Milky Way, which is like a history of like science and cosmology. And it basically talks about how there was a time period. I think I want uh, another reason I wanted to bring this is because I don't remember the dates. I think it was sometime in like the six or seven hundreds in Europe when basically the the seeds of the dark the the dark ages were planted, and like mankind had been making steady progress in their understanding of the universe, and like the Greeks had been developing it and all this other stuff, and then basically like the Christians took over and restored everything to a simplistic way of viewing the world and like, you know, uh, stopped calculating like the, stopped doing astronomy and all this other stuff and then things fell into like this, uh, this dark ages. And like, I got that vibe when he's saying here, basically that, that, oh yeah, hold on a second. I realize I'm segueing into the main idea. You want to theorize about the main idea in light of this yet? Or, or uh, you want to uh, take some time to think about for a thing? <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. To tie it all together. Mm -hmm. like a lot happened. Mm -hmm. But I do think the key is, is puzzle five. And still not quite like Still don't know why he's emphasizing the water so much. I'm kind of getting my main idea from one, two, and five. <laughs> why well, Davidus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even in the Meiri's framework, like I mean, I, that's how I was feeling with the Meiri. The way he sort of like turned it into the whole things about the collecting of the waters. Yeah, it's almost like he needed to do something with the fact that yeah. water is so emphasized. Right, right. Which doesn't. I don't think it's the most compelling yeah. uh, idea. I, yeah, like it yeah. makes sense. Yeah, if it's not. Right, I, okay. I, it doesn't seem Seems like you could have used a different metaphor for that. Yeah. Like, it could have been the exact, like, the collecting of the land. Right. You also, know, look, I mean, once he's talking, once Meiri is talking about the um, the heavens, which 
I, I don't think it's a bad job. I mean, because throne does mean that. So like, why not have the pair talk about Hashemayim and Mustafim Kulokel, like the heavens declare the glory of Hashem. Like that's really where the majesty is, you know, like, like, like the public before from chapter 19, you know, like waters, in other words, because waters are not the greatest display of God's majesty, it seems like they would have to play a stronger theme here, right. you know, like a particular, more specified. Yeah. Role. Oh, you know what though? Okay. He could be being sneaky. The Miri. The Miri. That he referenced um, Umal Haaretz Dea Es uh, that Hashem, that the request that David is making is until the entire earth is filled with the knowledge of Hashem. Um, and the end of that passage is Kamaim Liam Machasim, like waters that cover the seabed. So if he was using that as a muscle for knowledge, I would go along with that. I just don't see that in the Meiri, you know. But that would, that would fit into the theme of the parak. I mean, if you want to say that these waters are metaphorical, that through the like waters being a muscle for knowledge, and through the knowledge, then we recognize Hashem's majesty, then it would fit in much more seamlessly, you know. Yeah. Um, let me share my theory because we've got like five minutes, and then uh, and then um, there uh, I only really looked at the Meiri, but I'll have to see if there's another approach and see if we, we could do it next time. So here here's here's my uh, what I think the main idea is. Okay, is um, I think we kind of take it for granted that you can look out at the world and appreciate Chachma Hashem, you know. But in reality, you would not do that if you held that the universe was eternal. You would just view this as a feature of nature. And what the only way that you really know that the universe was created is through the Kabbalah, is through the tradition. And not only that, but through the Chachamim who can then elucidate the Chachma in nature. So in reality, the only thing that is causing God to be clothed with majesty, God created the world even if no one knew about it, right? Um, uh, but the only thing that makes him clothed in majesty, which has to do with our perception, is the fact that there has been this mithora of appreciating the Chachmah Hashem in nature, preserved through the Chachmah Yisrael, which is based on the fact that we were given this fact that God created the universe. And I think it's highlighting the fact that we need God to preserve that base you know, that house, in order for us to recognize God's grandeur. And if, if that ceases, then you lose out on all of Hashem's grandeur. And I think you can see this in, I mean, not to get political, but like you see this in like um, the anti-science factions within the Jewish people, that they are not seeing Hashem's grandeur through nature. You know, the thing maybe through Torah, but they're not seeing it through nature. And, and the real grandeur is from appreciating God as the creator, you know? So again, I, I think it's like, there's like this, uh, be I think because we live in a scientific era, it's hard for us to, or it's easy for us to forget that like for thousands and thousands of years, the average man would look out on, the na on nature and see spirits or see like gods fighting and then procreating out the mountains or like, you know, or we, or, or, or just, you know, Aristotle was like, just this is the nature of the universe and it's unchanging and there's no creation or design, you know? So it's really the fact that we have Chachamim that was given to Masora that have passed it down that allows us to see God's grandeur and then we ask our time to preserve the Chachamim. Mm -hmm. So that ties the whole thing together, except the waters, right. which seem to be like, even the way the Miri talks about it, like this is about God creation of the world and especially the waters. Like it's like he's like throwing it as an afterthought, you know? Right. Yeah. I kind of thought when you were saying before, it's not. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the fact though, that the water is separate from the earth, like allowed all that process to happen. Like, okay. You'd be dead right. if there was no separation right, of water true. and land, like we'd yeah. be underwater. Yeah, I mean, you could have made us with gills, I guess. Like, <laughs> yeah, go to that place, but like, right. So I, I'm going to give it equally. Uh, uh, I don't know if this is a satisfying thing. Is okay. I'll just say it. I gotta go say it. Okay, is that um that in the same sense that like if God didn't set it up in a way where the waters were kept in their boundaries, we would all be flooded. If God didn't give us the Eidos, then we would completely be uh, without this knowledge and recognition of God's grandeur. There's like a metaphorical parallel there right. in the sense that like God's the one who set the boundaries and God's the one who gave us these eight oaths so that we can recognize the significance of the setting of the boundaries and see his like his grandeur. Okay. okay. <laughs> it, it's poetic, like yeah. it, 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 it you know, works out well poetically. Okay. So I guess that was, that was, I would say that was, that was okay. Yeah. It was okay. Yeah. And now we can understand the connection to Ms. Moshe Lehman Shabbos. Okay, because Mizmer Rosh Hashanah and is about David appreciating God in, in nature. 
And then this follows it up by saying, but yeah, even David wouldn't be able to appreciate that if he had to start from scratch. Then he'd be like coping, he'd be in doubt. It's only because David has access to the Messorah of Yechme Ayin through the Torah and the preservation of the Chach, the, the Chachamim, that you're able to do that. You know, so it's like, Mizrafi and Travis, this was brought to you by Perak Sadi Gimel, you know, right. like, like the phenomenon there. And, and uh, uh, it ends on a Bakasha because we, we it's, Bakasha is our way of recognizing that we shouldn't take it for granted that this is just going to last forever. Like, no, there are threats. Like when the other nations threaten us and try to deny our Torah or kill our Chachamim, the whole thing could be jeopardized, you know, and you could like end up in another dark ages. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you go. I was finished the character in one shot. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, Moshe.